I will tell you my story. Our story. What is the reason, you ask? The story needs to be told. And if there is no one left to tell it, its meaning will be lost. Why now, you ask, when all lies shattered around us? Yes, you are right. But we are at the end of times. And when something ends, something else begins. So my story might yet live on in this world. They gave me different names. They called me the hero. The one who sacrificed everything to save the people and the land. They called me the destroyer. Who betrayed the trust of all races and brought the end of times. I am both. And I am neither. I want you to hear me. See through my eyes. Understand the reasons for the things I have done. And before I pass from this world, I need to be judged. I need you to judge me. dying, and we are dying with it. This was not always the case. Artara was once a place of wonder and beauty. The five races thrived in peace and harmony. Then, long ago, something happened. A cataclysm of unimaginable proportions. Something so disastrous. We don't even have a name for it. For when it destroyed our civilization, it took with it all knowledge of history. The past is now lost to us. Our future is uncertain. We are left trapped in a bleak and dismal present. The land itself is our enemy now. The weather extreme and unpredictable. Droughts persist for several weeks, followed by floods that wash everything away. Yet our gravest problem is the lack of sunlight. Storm clouds shroud our world in everlasting twilight. Without the sun, we are unable to grow food, and so we struggle to survive this dark world, a seemingly hopeless battle. I look back now to when I was a young boy, living on the fringe of the human domain. While hunting for food, I stumbled upon ruins uncovered by a recent earthquake. A bad omen, normally avoided. But this time, something drew me in. Descending the stairs led me to a crystal throne which glittered with swirling light. I felt strangely compelled to approach and sit. As I took my place upon it, a sudden torrent of light enveloped me. The illumination overwhelmed my senses. I grew nauseous and weak, but before I lost consciousness, the throne ejected me to the floor. I fled and told no one what happened for fear of being deemed tainted and banished from the village, for this was the way of my people. I tried to forget the experience, to convince myself it was my overactive imagination. But the visions that followed said otherwise. Every night, the nightmares came. Their torment highlighted my confusion, as each morning I remembered little, fragmented images, words which made no sense, nothing more. I would have 
thought myself mad if not for the strange, incomprehensible symbols I often drew in the sand. Proof that forces beyond my understanding were at work. People in my vicinity kept their distance, and I think they feared me. Over time, they learned to tolerate my unusual nature. But I was always alone, left to brood and ponder my strange fate. One winter, it all came flooding back to me. I realized the crystal throne sat not at the bottom of some ancient ruins, but at the top of a construction incomprehensible in scale. That the ruins were not ruins of some lost city or ancient castle, but a single massive tower buried deep within the earth. And buried upside down. Some unexplainable force had lifted the construction into the sky, rotated it, and driven it into the ground. In that moment of clarity, I knew one thing above all others. I had to go back to that place, for the power within was the one thing that could save Artara. Years later, I found myself a commander in the last human kingdom's militia. The king, a just man and good friend, granted me a favor for my years of loyal service. I had but one request, a small force of men and resources to return to the village of my birth and explore the tower. Preoccupied by an eroding empire, the king held little interest in ancient ruins and towers. He did, however, see the reclaiming of a long-abandoned village on the border of an ever-shrinking kingdom as a boost to the people's morale. He gave me what I requested, and his blessing. So, here I am. Returning to the very place which has haunted me my entire life. It is a desolate place now. Time has not been kind to my village. Most of it has rotted or been washed away. Yet the tower remains just as I remember it. I am in awe of the power within. And perhaps fearful. The men and I are setting up the camp in the village, while Cain and Maev, two of my most capable warriors, will scout the tower. Once again, I feel its call. We must uncover its secrets. We must find a way to reach the power within. If we fail, it will be the end of us. This land was once a beautiful place. All five races lived in relative peace and harmony. Trade flourished and technological advancements were made. Humans were the most populous and occupied the central lands. Dwarves lived in the highlands of the west and built underground cities filled with precious stones. Elves were caretakers of vast living forests in the east. To the north, mighty frostlings ruled icy plains and frozen seas. To the south, mystical shadow people wandered great deserts. The world was in balance. There was no magic as we know it today. No mysterious powers over air or fire. No magic-fueled artifacts able to grind mountains to dust. There were godlike beings, rulers of four elements, but their power came from immortality and wisdom, not from mystical force. Instead, there was progress, technological advancements that gave races control over the world, steam machines, electricity, 
amber stones which could harness the energy of the sun, medicine, metallurgy, and flying machines. People's ambitions raised ever higher to reach the stars one day. Then, one day, strange globes of dark blue light began to appear in random places. People did not know what to make of them, but they soon learned that if touched, they were absorbed by the body, giving the person mystical powers. They could heal wounds, call rain to fertilize crops, or lift heavy objects. Most people assumed this power came from the earth itself as a reward for them being worthy or caring about the land so much. Only some doubted that and wondered where the power really came from and what would be the real price to pay for it. The races soon abandoned all research into new technologies. They grew complacent, weak. Even the elves, usually reserved and aloof, became consumed by this newly found omnipotence. Why waste time and energy if you could get everything with a wave of your hand? Why grow crops if you could summon up a table full of exotic delicacies and noble drinks? They drank and danced all day and night long and they all ignored the first signs of the change. People began to fall ill. One by one, their senses began to fail. Their sight, hearing, taste. Nothing that a short burst of power couldn't heal, at first. But the more power they absorbed, the more serious their illness became. Some became paralyzed. Some stopped caring and stood motionless, just staring into the sky. Some just stopped eating and died. And then came the visions. People started to see things around them. Dark shapes floating in the wind, circling, watching, waiting. Less than one year after the coming of the Power Nodes, Lords of the Five Races gathered to discuss the chaos that had ensued. It was decided that the use of magic had to be prohibited, contained, and researched. Four edicts were passed. The first edict proclaimed that all Mana Nodes were to be collected and stored in Mana Crystals for authorized use only. Under the second edict, all those who passed aptitude tests were to abandon their families and to travel to a designated place of study and learning to become magi. The third edict stated that all other people were forbidden to absorb and use mana under penalty of death. Finally, the fourth edict, the most important of all, decreed that research into the origins of the power would take the utmost priority. A great tower was constructed where all magi gathered and trained. It was a place independent of all races and their rulers, governed by the first magi, each the most skilled of their generation. They were wise in their administration of the power as they knew the threats of its overuse. Crystal golems had been constructed and traveled the land, seeking out the new nodes that continued to appear. A vast quantity of mana was thus brought to the tower where it was stored in great crystal chambers. The use of magic was restricted to the direst need and had to be sanctioned by the first magi. Within the tower, intensive efforts to discover the origins of the power nodes continued. Balance returned to the land for some time. And then came Proteus, the greatest magi that ever lived, famed for his wisdom his control over magic was unmatched. He devoted his entire life to the research, experimenting in ways never before tried. One day, he achieved a breakthrough. He managed to tap into the power at the deepest level, integrating it fully into his life force. 
His spirit connected to the essence of the magic, and he understood. He learned that the nodes had come from beings called the Organte. They dwelled in another place, and perhaps in another time. In a universe incomprehensibly alien to our own. In that brief moment, when his spirit traveled to that place, he glimpsed into the history of the Organte and understood their plan. And the truth of it terrified him beyond all imagination. The Organte had been a race of spacefaring people. Their home was a distant galaxy. They evolved countless eons ago and colonized their stretch of space. They were wise and gentle beings, gladly helping other races on their path to greatness. Their power was unrivaled and their command of technology complete. They enforced stability in their galaxy, so it thrived in peace and harmony. For many thousand generations, they were satisfied with this. Then a sense of unease slowly overcame them, for they lacked a purpose in their continuous existence. They decided to aspire for transcendence as a race, to abandon their physical bodies and turn into beings of energy and thought, to leave their grand cities, Dyson spheres, all their technology, and move into the vast nothingness of space to thrive there. They fed on energy, on loose protons and electrons, on sun discharges, on specks of matter traveling between star systems. It was a moment of great joy in the galaxy, for the races knew that with such benevolent and omnipotent guardians, nothing could threaten their existence. For countless millennia, the Organte were satisfied, for they could experience their existence on new levels. Yet they did not realize one thing. The total pool of energy is finite at the galactic level. There was less and less unclaimed energy available to sustain their life force. They had to resort to more extreme methods. They exploded suns into supernovas, in places distant from other sentient races and fed on released energy. They entered supermassive black holes to drain them of the energy contained within Event Horizon. But those sources were limited as well. Desperate and growing more and more hungry, they created hypersuns, combining the power of a thousand stars into one giant sun, and exploded them to create hypernovas, with enough power to obliterate and sterilize the entire galaxy, should the energy not have been entirely absorbed by a swarming mass of ravenous organte. But that was also not enough. They tried to move to another galaxy, but the void in between did not allow this, for nothing can exist in that space which is not a space, not even a thought. Despairing, the Organte decided then to end their existence, not willing to harm other sentient races, who watched with growing horror at the devastation of their galaxy. So they stopped looking for new energy sources, gathered themselves all in one place, and waited for the end. They lingered in dark space for a long time, but the end did not come. Their life force, made of thought, could not die, and they grew even hungrier. Maddened by their desire to feed, they descended on the rest of the galaxy, absorbing all that stood in their path, all sentient races, their ships, their planets, their suns. No longer caring about killing billions of intelligent life forms, they cared only about the energy they contained. Soon nothing was left, an empty space, devoid of even a single electron of energy. Just the Organte. The change in the nature of the Organte allowed them a different understanding of the laws of physics. They discovered connection points between galaxies, 
places where space and time bend and connect. They searched feverishly for a new feeding ground and discovered a point in space connecting their universe to ours, located right above our planet. It was just a window which they couldn't open, yet. For the laws of physics in our universe were different from the ones of the Organte. They needed a stable bridge to cross over. So, they devised a plan. They needed to release some of their energy into our world, to mix it together and build a stable connection in between. Billions of the Organte sacrificed their last remaining life force, turning it into a state of consciousness to create nodes of power, which then were pushed through the window and placed on our planet. The nodes of energy, which we called magic, people absorbed it, mixed it with their own life force, and then released it into the world, creating new energy in the process. This new energy was now compatible with the Organtes and could be used by them. The perfect trap taunt the people with power so immense that they did not question the price they paid for it. So now, the Organte simply waited with anticipation until enough energy would be present to allow them to create the connection bridge, waiting to be able to descend on our galaxy and consume it. I will never forget my creators, the Magi who refused the great sacrifice, those who would later be branded rebels and traitors. But their intent was not always in opposition. In the beginning their goal was the same noble objective as Proteus himself, protect Artara at any cost. But where Proteus saw the war with the Organti all but lost, my creators believed the shadow threat could yet be overcome. They experimented with every means possible to develop the ultimate constructs. Artificial beings who followed orders fearlessly with unwavering persistence and unquestioned loyalty. The perfect warriors. While their efforts bore fruit, no construct of Magi design stood superior to the Organti creations and each passing day brought the invaders one step closer to Artara's seemingly inevitable conquest. The Magi quickly surmised they would not succeed without aid from the first Magus. In his rage over the Magi's defiance, Proteus erected an impenetrable barrier around his level of the tower, severing all contact with the outside world. Already having failed to breach the barrier themselves, my creators turned to their construct creations, but like their masters, they too failed. On the verge of conceding defeat, the Magi underwent one last attempt at a new construct. No longer intent on creating a breed of soldiers capable of winning a war, they focused on a single soldier. A construct created for one purpose alone, to break Proteus's barrier. The rebel magi crafted a construct bound directly to the tower itself, a truly unique meld of magic and technology unlike anything that had come before it. In their crowning achievement, the tower avatar was brought online, and I was eager to fulfill my duty. The Magi and Lords were appalled at this revelation. How can you fight an enemy that is all-powerful and does not have a physical form? They immediately banned the use of power without exception, hoping that there was not yet enough mixed energy for the Organte to be able to open a bridge. Thousands of crystal golems were created and positioned across the land to immediately absorb any new node before it could be used. Any attempt to use this power carried the threat of immediate execution. 
everyone was hoping that it would be enough, that it was not too late. The Organte, waiting on the other side of the portal, soon realized that people had uncovered their deception. There was not enough new energy in the world for them to create a stable bridge yet, but they could project their thoughts through the barrier. They abandoned all pretense and took a direct approach. They began to create inanimate constructs across the land, whose only purpose was to destroy. People tried to fight them with technology, building mechanized golems of their own. But they did not have the time or resources to protect the whole land. Destruction spread across. Within a few years, most of the land was in ruins. People of all races gathered in heavily fortified locations, not knowing the time and place of the next attack. Then, one day, a heavy attack came upon Elven capital city. The defenders were overrun and a terrible slaughter began. Desperate and maddened with anger, the Council of Elven Magi broke the treaty and lashed out at the attackers with a power, what had been prohibited and exactly what the Organte were hoping for. In a few moments, all the attackers were shattered by the terrible destructive force of the magic. I was the Tower Avatar, the most powerful Magi construct ever created. As my creators commanded, I descended against Proteus's barrier with all my might. Yet, despite my fullest effort, the first Magus's defense would not yield. Desperate, the Magi decided to do the unprecedented and imbue one of their constructs with consciousness and free will. Their last hope a self-determinate construct would outsmart the barrier. And so, for the first time, I opened my eyes, looking out among the world, no longer a weapon by design, but as my own free person. A person without any passion to risk life and limb for the sake of disabling a barrier set by some all-powerful Magus who wish to be left alone. The Magi scrambled before me, awash with anxiety. They tried to hide their thoughts of regret. Notions they miscalculated made a rash decision that had lost them their one and final hope. I had no wish to disappoint my creators. I listened to their explanation of the Organti threat the purpose of the tower, and their desperate need to reach Proteus. For the Magi now believed with certainty, without Proteus's help, all was lost. The Magi made me far stronger than any mortal being. They filled my mind with their combined knowledge, making my intelligence second to none. And they had at last breathed true life into me, giving me free will. And yet once more, they ordered me back to the barrier, once again reducing me to nothing more than a weapon. The other races were so consumed with grief and rage at seeing their world being destroyed around them in such a pointless manner that they also started to revert to magic. They tapped into vast reserves of power, collected and stored across many centuries. Terrible forces were unleashed at the attackers, people no longer bound by any laws and filled with an all-consuming hatred. However, the land was being destroyed in the process. Seas boiled, mountains were crushed, and volcanoes erupted. Even the moon was shattered and the planet became unstable. Yet no one seemed to care. All that mattered was the overwhelming power and being able to direct this destructive force at the heart of the enemy. Then one day, everything stopped. No new enemies appeared. No new attack came. No one had any illusions that the enemy had been defeated. 
people looked around and only then realized what they had done to their world. The damage was terrible. Most cities lay in ruins. Volcanoes erupted, blanketing the earth with ash. Storm clouds rolled day and night. Far above the ground, a black portal appeared. A window to Argante world. A sign that enough energy had been transformed and a bridge was possible. Most just surrendered or despaired, waiting for the inevitable. Only Proteus and his faithful Magi refused to give up. Proteus knew that it would take some time for the portal to be fully opened. When he visited the universe of the Organte, he learned about the differences in the law of physics. This bridge could not be destroyed, but it could be contained, and the entrance point blocked. He also knew that they had about five years before the connection became fully formed. Five years to devise a plan to save the world, or five years before everything and everyone was consumed. While the world was dying around them, Proteus and the remaining Magi devoted all their time and resources to stopping the Organte. Using the remaining reserves of magic power, they extended the tower so it reached the portal, far above ground, for physical contact with the bridge was necessary at the moment of opening. Once the tower was completed, it was the time for great sacrifice. One thousand remaining Magi did the last thing they could do. First, they purged their bodies of the alien energy, restoring their own original life force. Then, they willingly granted all of this pure essence to Proteus, dying in the process. Their sacrifice created a god, for only a god could oppose such an immense power. And this god looked at the bodies of his friends and family around him and wept, his heart broken with grief. Proteus then ascended the tower, sat in front of the portal on a crystal chair and waited for its opening. On the other side, he could see a swarm of the Organte waiting to cross over. He could feel their immense hunger. He could hear their obsessive thoughts of destruction, and he despaired. Yet his resolve was strong. He was the last hope for the land, for his people, and perhaps for all the other sentient beings in the galaxy. The Magi endowed me with true self-determination, yet despite this miracle, ordered me back to Proteus's barrier. Clearly something was amiss. To my deepest regret, the truth did not evade me for long. My creator's inner thoughts revealed a web of shadows and lies, and one horrible truth. The Magi no longer sought Proteus to recruit his aid, but instead to kill him to remove the final obstruction preventing the Organti arrival. Shortly after I came into this world, I was forced to choose between my parents, the duty they set upon me, and my own morality. I chose to stay faithful, not to my creators, but to the people of Artara. For many days and nights, the tower erupted in war. The Magi fought with ravenous desperation, and though formidable, underestimated the powers at my disposal. I retasked the ancient crystal golems into warriors, and created new constructs of my own design. When the Magi banded together in the depths of the tower for one final stand, I descended upon them with the full might of the tower and destroyed them all. I took no pleasure in destroying my misguided creators, but my vow and duty is to the Tower and Artara. I have sworn to stand vigil over both for time eternal. After all the Magi's lies, Proteus's goal supports my own. 
protect the tower and the people of Artara. Unwilling to lower his barrier, the first Magus has remained confined. He leaves me to protect the tower as I see fit, and I in turn leave him to his own. But I must learn more of this Proteus, for I have already glimpsed a sliver of dark organti influence in his mind. I sense it is only a matter of time before he too is corrupted by their lies. Only a matter of time until I must destroy the first Magus. Then, after countless days and nights, Proteus felt the surge of power. A bridge had stabilized, and the Organte were ready to cross. He stood up and approached the portal. He projected all his life force into an energy disk and thrust it into the portal. When he and the other Magi had devised the plan, they were hoping that the different laws of physics in the two universes would negate each other in the connection point and yet coexist at the same time. They assumed that their energy would nullify energy of the Organte, creating a void zone which nothing could cross. When he heard a mind-shattering cry of rage from the other side, he knew they were correct. The bridge was blocked, and the Organte could not cross. As long as this one was opened, they could not form a different bridge elsewhere. The bridge was blocked, but not closed. His life force still depended on his body, so he knew he had to protect it somehow, hide it. So he raised the tower above the ground, then turned it around and thrust it deep into the ground to prevent anyone from ever reaching him. The portal, the bridge, still connected to him, was taken deep below ground. Deep underground, covered by layers of rock and dirt, Proteus sits on his crystal throne and keeps his eternal watch, his life force the only thing preventing destruction. Two opposing forces waiting ever since for the resolution of this struggle. Proteus can hear the Organte's whispers from the other side, pleading, begging, reasoning. He can also feel their thoughts, boundless maddening rage, but also their equally infinite patience. For the Organte know that nothing in the universe is eternal, apart from their hunger. They know that all things must come to an end, and only they will remain beyond the end of time. So, here we are. Two minds in one body. You witnessed what I have done. I opened the portal and let the Organte through. The ultimate betrayal. Shadow constructs are ravaging the land, destroying everything and everyone in the path. They leave me alone, for they believe I am the ally of their masters. Yet, you must understand the reasons for my actions. For I did not lie those many years ago when you were a child and our minds touched for the first time. The world can be saved, and only you can do it. The entire world, our galaxy. If we let the Organte set foot on this land, they will soon ravage all the other planets in our galaxy too. The Organte pass through the bridge into our world, but they are weak. They come from a place with different laws of physics. They are disoriented, stunned. They have to assume physical bodies and need time to adjust to our energy. A lot of time. And if something has a physical shape, it can be destroyed. My actions were for that reason. My life force was the only thing blocking the bridge. And I am dying. If I were to die and they were to enter the world, they would be unopposed. They would bide their time recovering. And when they were ready, they would destroy everything. For such is their nature now. Hateful, 
and evil. I spent a long time in the presence of those beings. I understand them now in more ways than they understand themselves. They might have been a grand and noble civilization, but now only a husk remains. Their nature overpowered by the need to consume and destroy. I also understood one thing that they do not know yet. In our universe, they will not be able to transcend again. They will remain as they are now, in physical form. They will need to send their constructs to nearby stars, to absorb their energy, filter it, and feed on it slowly. Don't be fooled, however. They will awaken eventually, and start rebuilding their civilization. So I am releasing your mind now. Take this body and all the knowledge I possess, and escape this world, for it is already doomed. I have gathered the remaining survivors in the tower, and I will shift it across vast space to another planet, where you can settle in peace. I will transfer my consciousness to this shadow and remain here. I will walk among the Organte unnoticed, observing them and confusing them if I can, for as long as I can. You have a different task. You must rebuild the civilization and grow in strength. You must pass the knowledge of what has happened to your descendants, and they must stand vigil. When the time comes, you must be ready to return to this world and destroy the enemy once and for all. For only then can I be redeemed. Stand vigil. Watch the sky with an ever open eye. When stars dim and start to die, come swiftly or the end follows nigh.